Center, SARC, in Beaverton, Oregon. Through SARC, Amy has developed and implements a nine-session sexual violence primary prevention education curriculum to high schools in three counties. The curriculum has been developed using evidence-based and theory-driven practices and has been utilizing assessments to evaluation the efficiency of the program for the past four years. Um, today's webinar will walk you through practical steps of how to develop or implement a prevention program in your area schools. So, Amy, we're going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see people logged on and ready to go. So, please feel free, as already stated, to ask questions either through raising your hand or using the chat feature. Um, I did not jam this full of content because so often people have questions and I think it's really valuable and a lot of those questions end up being overlapping with other people's questions. So um, feel free to ask them and know that if you have that question, somebody else probably has something similar on their mind. Um, so again, my name is Amy Loftus and I am with uh, the Sexual Assault Resource Center, often referred to as SARC. Um, I've been with this agency for about nine years and have watched this program grow and have helped grow this program from one presentation to three presentations and then made the huge leap of faith into nine um, presentations in order to fulfill that desire to be doing true primary prevention. And so um, I have a couple questions built in for people coming up because I want to know kind of where you're at and if people are hoping to make that leap into um, more primary prevention instead of awareness-based education. So here we go. Just so you can kind of see where we are at and where we are headed um, throughout the webinar. So if you have questions and you know you have things you're going to want to ask, you can see if we're going to be covering it all or if it's something that you should just ask right away. Um, I'm going to quickly kind of go through what our prevention program looks like. Um, We'll also cover what prevention is to make sure that we're all defining primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention in the same manner and using kind of operating definitions. Um, we will talk about creating versus adopting curriculum and or doing a little bit of both, which I sometimes think is the best way to go. Um, we'll talk about what are those nine principles of prevention, um, and specifically we're going to be focusing on a few of those throughout our webinar. Um, we're going to talk about using external resources, providing community assessments, making sure that everything that you're doing is theory driven, um, how to ensure that your educators are educated and ready to go into the classroom, and then how to evaluate um, your program and change what doesn't work and keep what does. Um, and then the age-old question of how do I get in to schools? So I know some of you are probably already there and others of you are just totally lost of how to get in. And so we will go over some of what has worked at least for me on my end and I know um, from talking to other people doing prevention what has worked for them as well. And that I assume people will have questions about also. So we do nine sessions here at SARC. We have a nine session curriculum and I'm going to cover what topics we go over in those classrooms. We are based in high school health um, classrooms, typically in health two. So Oregon tends to have their high schools break their health curriculum up into health one, usually taken freshman or sophomore year, health two, usually taken your junior or senior year, and then there are some other classes like health topics and stuff, but we are predominantly find ourselves in health two um, curricula, health two classes where we see predominantly 11th graders and then there are some outliers, sometimes 10th and sometimes 12th graders. We do go to um, schools in three different counties, in Washington, Clackamas, and Multnomah counties. And for those of you who are looking to import a curriculum and are worried about making sure that it matches and meets the needs of the population that you're serving, um, that is something I can really speak to. The three counties we go to are vastly different. Um, in one of the schools, you can literally look out across the street and see cows in a field. 
And in another one, it is in um, an urban northeast Portland setting. So we are all over the board. Um, and so we can talk to the importance of making sure that it is um, culturally relevant um, and that you can, it's possible to do that with one curriculum. And then we also have been administering pre and post evaluations for the last four years now, and we use that um, evaluation information to assess for efficacy, see what works, see what doesn't, see if we are um, being culturally relevant, and then make the appropriate changes um, predominantly in the summer when we have time to sit down and really evaluate the data and then make updates and changes to the curriculum. So before we keep going, I always think it's really important to make sure that we are all on the same page with what we're talking about when we say prevention. SARC's curriculum is based off of being a primary prevention education program, meaning that we are talking about root causes of sexual violence. We are looking at um, skill building and addressing um, norms and beliefs around sexual violence before initial perpetration or victimization happens. I think with any education program, you will dabble in and cover some secondary and tertiary prevention information. Um, obviously, we tell them about SARC and our other services. We um, talk about long-term um, effects on um, survivors of sexual violence, and some of that we do still through this lens of primary prevention of trying to build empathy and stuff, but our primary goal is to prevent initial perpetration. And so that is when you hear me refer to primary prevention throughout today's webinar and our program, that is what our program is focused on and how we are defining primary prevention. And this, these definitions come um, directly from the CDC's website and how that they are classifying the different types of prevention work out there. Okay, so here's the information about SARC and, and our curriculum topics. And then I've got a couple questions for you guys which will help me feel connected to you and the work that you're doing and help me also kind of guide how to um, continue forward sharing the information that we've got about our prevention program. So day one, and I'm not going to belabor any of this, but I do think it's important for you guys to be able to see kind of what we're covering. And we can always come back if people have a lot of questions about specifically what we cover and why. We can always double back to this slide if we need to. But um, we do kind of the essay 101, laying down the groundwork. I always tell students that this is like that first day of class, the orientation day. This is who's SARC, what are we about, what definitions are we talking about, what's the scope of the problem of sexual violence. I always try to make sure that um, I share my link to why I do this work, and I give the students an opportunity to make links in their own lives to the topic of violence in general. Um, and it brings the gravity of the topic into the classroom instead of just being something that happens out in the community. And this is also when we do our pre-evaluations, um, and they are anonymous and confidential. Day two is anti-oppression work. Um, day three is kind of a follow-up after they've had time to walk away and kind of sit with the gravity of that topic. and and making their own personal links and understanding. And so we do a wrap-up activity to bring some closure. And then we build on anti-oppression um, on the power and non-power chart by looking at gender stereotypes. Day four is dedicated to healthy sexual relationships, um, talking a lot about consent and what healthy sexual relationships are versus what they aren't, which is what we often as a culture, I think, tend to say, you know, healthy sexual relationships are not unequal in power. They are not forcing people um, to do things they don't want to do. Um, and so it's a great day to sit and say, well, then what are they and what, what should be in a healthy sexual relationship and how do you know you have consent? We then do a day about media, looking at media messaging. Um, I always like to point this out, although I know that there are a lot of service providers, and you probably all know this, but I also think it's important to say, 
it's not that if media goes away, violence goes away. What I love about the media section is it's this great opportunity to um, share the cultural and social pieces and stories and context that goes on behind the scenes and that by the time we see those images in the media, there's usually a deep cultural context of information that is so vital to understand in a culture where sexual violence happens at such high rates. Um, it also lays the groundwork nicely for us to be the next day coming back and talking about pornography um, and the links there between pornography and what the studies have shown around um, the outcomes for men and women um, looking at pornography. We then go to victim empathy and victim blaming. And then we end our last two days with bystander intervention. Um, and I know that this is kind of um, we do a lot on red flag scenarios and then in the moment, like if you see violence. So it's um, a lot of this is really focusing on that primary prevention piece of the bystander intervention of, okay, this seems like a high risk situation. I don't know what could, what's going to happen, um, but there's an opportunity for violence to, to occur in this situation. And so let's um, step in and have some skills. And it's a lot of skill building and practicing and role playing and um, practicing their interventions. And then we do our wrap up and our goodbyes and our post evaluation on the last day. Um, really quick, I saw a question come through about whether we do this um, back to back each day. And the answer is no, it's a great question. Our curriculum is nine sessions, we could do it back to back, but typically how we are scheduled is to come in once a week. So I usually go to the same school like every Wednesday for nine sessions. Some schools will book us like every Monday, Tuesday, and then not only it takes one month essentially to um, go through the curriculum. And so it kind of depends on the school and the scheduling, but typically it's once a week. Let's see, if there's any other questions I've missed, somebody can... Yeah, Amy, I think we've got two questions also that came up there. Um, one of them is uh, follows up with what you were just speaking on. Um, a person asked, how long is each session? Oh, also a good question. I um, Our curriculum is built for one, an hour and 10 minute classes. That's typically what the classes are here. And then each day has um, additional activity at the bottom of the curriculum that either builds on just the overarching understanding of sexual violence as a whole or an actual other um, activity to go along with the topic of the day for when we are scheduled for block classes because some schools do have hour and a half long classes. So nothing shorter than an hour and 10 minutes and it's so beautiful when it's an hour and a half. And then did you say there was also one other question that I missed? Yeah. Um, also, there was a question. Can you talk about what specific forms of oppression you speak to in day two and three? Got it. Yes, absolutely. So um, we look at – we do a couple activities with them that really tangibly kind of put into perspective what oppression is and how oppression is experienced. So we define the term. We, um, I give them lots of examples about how oppression is not an idea or a thought, but it's an action that is taken against groups of people to um, disempower, to um, enable uh, groups in power to stay in power. Um, and so we do a very physical activity to highlight how oppression can be felt because oftentimes we know that unless you're experiencing oppression, it can remain relatively or completely um, invisible to you. Um, we put those, that, that physical activity that we do into a list of who in our culture do we inherently give power to, who, do, who is in non-power, and then what do we call that? And that's where we name all the isms. And what we, um, let me give it, I'm just looking to make sure I'm answering this question. Um, and then we make sure that we are, of course, linking all this to violence to understand that people on the non-power side um, experience higher rates of violence than people on the power side. Um, and then our wrap-up activity is allowing them, instead of looking just at the definitions and 
the global experience or the, the experience here in the U.S. around anti-oppression, but to actually have them share stories of times where they've experienced oppression or seen other people experience oppression, um, because the first day really doesn't allow for their personal experiences or links to the topic. Thanks, Amy. Actually, a few more questions popped up here, if you don't mind. No, not at all. And since they're related, we thought we would bring them up now. So someone asked if you're doing this with one class. Great question. Also, um, typically when I, when I go, I don't combine classes. I've done that before, and that's something to keep in mind if you're not already in the classroom. Teachers will sometimes ask you if you want to combine two classes. Um, I typically always say no um, because classroom sizes, at least here in Oregon and I'm sure elsewhere, um, get to be up to, you know, it's not unheard of to have 37 to 42 students in a classroom. And, and the connection that you make with students around the topic is just, diluted when you combine classes. So I typically will go between sometimes two teachers in a day and we'll do anywhere from four to five presentations in a day. Wow, thank you. And then also related to that, do you um, do all of this with all genders together or do you separate um, students out? Nope, it's mixed gendered mainstream high school classrooms. I have done gender specific um, Groupings in the summer, I've gone to a couple um, summer school programs where it's been all boys in one class and all girls in another class, and those are interesting and engaging and sort of different in their own right, but as a whole, our, our, pro our program is really based in mainstream high school classrooms with mixed gender students. Great. And then in your curriculum, is there a point that you work on setting healthy boundaries as a form of prevention? In the healthy sexuality piece, we talk about what students want in a healthy sexual relationship. Um, we talk about what their individual, I guess boundaries is one word. I always tell them it's, I, I always tell them it's thinking about what they want in a relationship, setting that standard and realizing that they're not setting the bar too high, that that's okay to demand those things in a relationship if they are something that they need. Um, and so we mainly talk about really healthy communication, but I always tell students too that if they know when to say yes, it's a lot easier to say no because we all know that it's easy to get carried away in the moment and to have something feel good physically, but emotionally and mentally you're not there. And so to have kind of in place what you need and want in a healthy sexual relationship and so you know when things are missing, it makes it a lot easier to have those boundaries and hold them. Um, and the other part of boundaries I would say too that we discuss is when you're in a healthy sexual relationship that you're not the only one that has to hold those boundaries, that your partner cares equally as much about your boundaries, even if theirs are different, that they help you hold those boundaries because the sexual health of you and your partner is, is vital and key in a healthy relationship. Thanks, Amy. So, and then I saw somebody ask about if I were going to share um, any of the activities that are in the curriculum. Again, we can come back to this slide if at the end when we have more time. If we have more time, I'm happy to come back to this one. And if people have specific questions like, well, what activity do you do here or there? Um, I'm also happy to talk more at the end about getting our curriculum. Um, we charge nominally just for the CD and um, shipping in like $20 gets you nine sessions of curriculum, a pre and post assessment and evaluation tool. So all of it. So we can talk more about that later. So it's, it's a very economical way and I always, and I'll tell you more about adopting curriculum. So if you guys don't mind, we'll come back to that. Um, and then again, if there's more questions I miss as they come up, please interject as they seem. Um, like they will fit. So we've got people answering. Thank you. I'm going to keep waiting for the total responses to go up. But if you are currently doing some sort of education in your community, I would, I'd like to know if you are or you are not. I'm going to hold out for a few more responses and then we'll, we'll publish so you guys can see the results. So far, though, a lot. We're going to skip to the results. Looks like people have stopped kind of voting in. Um, so, yeah, a lot of you guys are doing education in your community, which is wonderful. 
I would like to then know if you guys are hoping to increase dosage. So if you already are doing not seven to nine sessions, which is kind of laid out by the CDC as primary prevention, and you feel good about the times that you're seeing, the number of times you're seeing the people that you're educating, um, then your answer is no, you don't, you're not hoping to increase, obviously. But if you are at a place where you're like, man, I'm seeing these students three times, and I'd like to be seeing them at least seven, um, then you'd be answering yes. I'll wait for a few more. Okay. So vast majority of you are hoping to increase your dosage. Um, great. I'm so glad that's on people's radar. It is possible. I will just say that right off the bat to give you some some glimmer of hope. We've done it, so I know it's possible. It is a scary sort of leap in faith that when you make the shift, that the schools that you're in, and I'm going to continue to say schools just because this is what the webinar is about, so I'm assuming a lot of you guys are in schools. But it's a leap of faith. But in our experience, the schools came with us because it was well-grounded. So are you hoping to use this information? Um, I think there's a word missing to get started in creating a prevention program. So if you have not, if you're not, if you're just hoping to get going in a prevention program, um, you'd be answering yes. Um, so I see a question here that asks if our curriculum addresses issues of homophobia, homophobia and sexualized bullying and harassment, and if so, where in the curriculum. On one of the anti-oppression days, we definitely talk about um, power, non-power based on sexuality. And then, again, it comes up on the gender stereotyping day. Um, so, yes, we do bring it up. It does come up naturally in class. It's structured somewhat into the curriculum on the oppression days. Um, on top of that, our curriculum is very inclusive. Um, it's not all gender neutral, but a lot of it is. We have role plays that are um, that have role plays based on straight and um, homosexual relationships, we define LGBTQI. So there's a lot of stuff in there. It's not a, um, oh, it's not an indicated curriculum. It's not for a specific population. Um, and so that piece is in there. And I hope that answers your question, Rick, um, who asked that. And if not, please come back at me with another one. And no, we do not, another question, we do not address sex scene or internet safety. We, I guess what we do address a little bit is in the pornography day, the, um, the fact that once an image is out, even if you're the one that puts that image of yourself out there through sex scene or file sharing or any other way that students proliferate images of themselves, that you no longer um, have the ownership of that image. And so we talk a little bit about that, but certainly we do not have a whole section based on sexting and internet safety at all. Um, I know a lot of that happens at the junior high level, um, or should be at least, I should say, but um, that's where I've seen a lot of the curriculums that are created for sexting and internet safety is geared towards junior high um, programs. Okay, so we are seeing kind of a split. So I'm assuming this is because some people are already in schools and so they've got stuff going underway and then other people are, yes, looking absolutely to start, um, to get started even creating a, a, a program, so. Okay. So here is what we are going to do is I'm going to tell you kind of our approach to how we've developed this curriculum and then we're going to get going into what do you do with this then and how do you get from three sessions to seven or nine or get started, um, do you adopt, do you create, all of those key questions. So I always joke, although this looks now that I have it written up as four, I always joke that I have my, my curriculum trifecta, my, my three-pronged approach to curriculum development. 
I always make sure that what we're doing and what we're developing is well-grounded in either evidence-based programs that other people have proven or has a grounding in theory-driven research because there have been times where I will have done an activity somewhere in a training and I think, man, this is great. It would resonate with students and then I do it and it doesn't. And so I just keep coming back to the fact that I don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are people out there that knows that know what works. They've tested it. Um, and so that is really always our starting place. And I'm going to talk more about how we go about collecting all that, that information and research that's out there in a minute. Anything that's in yellow, by the way, is one of the nine principles of prevention. And so I'm just putting it in yellow so that you guys can see kind of um, an approach, one of our key approaches along with the ecological model to curriculum development. We always develop a community assessment. Basically what this is is a survey of the students in the counties that we'll be serving. Um, I don't know that, I can't think of a single curriculum that we've created without student input because it's invaluable. They are the, the group of people that we will be um, educating and they need to have a voice in what is being taught. I always make sure that I um, have as much in-depth training as I possibly can get, and we're going to talk more about each of these things, and I make sure that when I have volunteers that they're well-educated on the topic as well before they head into the classroom, and um, we always then evaluate our program to make sure that our approach is working and to change what isn't working. Okay, so the question, to adopt or to create? Um, they both have, this is, I think sometimes is a balancing act. Curriculum building is a big task and um, there are definitely ways to create meaningful curriculum and it will save you time in the long run to take those steps necessary to build a curriculum that is as effective as it can be from the beginning. And adopting curriculum, I think, sometimes seems like it's a lot easier to do, but ensuring cultural relevancy can also be a task in itself. Um, I think there's also this balancing act between what you want to do, what you have time for, what you have money to do, and what is actually feasible. I am a huge fan of, when you can, some adopt curriculums that you adopt you have to use. Um, you have to use it exactly the way that it's been given to you um, so that they can continue to test, you know, for fidelity and all of that and make sure that it's the program and all of that. But when you can, import it in a curriculum and create some of your own and evaluate. I think sometimes doing kind of a marriage between these two approaches is really great for time and um, to make sure that it is culturally relevant for those that you're serving. Um, Okay, so really quickly just to show you guys, um, for those of you unfamiliar and for those of you even familiar, I mean, the, yellow, the words in yellow again are the kind of the pieces of today's webinar that we're going to be covering. However, CERC absolutely uses the nine principles of prevention and the ecological model have been the two kind of approaches to our whole, pro, our whole prevention programs um, development and the framework. Um, so we'll be looking at the theory-driven, socio-culturally relevant piece, the outcome evaluation, and well-trained staff. But please know that we've got all the other pieces in there as well and are reflected in the actual overall program if you were to take a look at our, our prevention program as a whole. Okay, so as you are thinking, okay, if we have three, if we're seeing students three times right now and we want to go to seven or nine, how in the world can we possibly get there on our own? I cannot stress the importance of finding external resources that are available to you and utilizing them in a really meaningful way. So. I named a few local colleges and universities, coalitions or state agencies, and then other nonprofits that are doing prevention especially can really be useful community partners. Um, to utilize these, these partnerships, um, you, the way we've used it is to bolster our development. So I'll give you an example. Last year we were looking to in 
add the topic of pornography to our nine sessions. And it kind of organically came out of what students were asking for um, as, as a piece of the media section. And I kept ignoring it because, quite frankly, the thought of talking about pornography in a high school just really scared me. I wasn't quite sure how to have that conversation. And so instead of just kind of making it up, we use the community partner that we've utilized and have a wonderful partnership with for the last five years or so with Portland State University. And um, there's a professor there, Dr. Keith Kaufman, who has a six month, um, it's a two term, six month psychology class. And his students that are assigned to our group kind of act um, as consultants for our, for my program specifically. And they'll work on whatever project we kind of ask them to. And so typically what I have them do every year is a comprehensive literature review on the topic at hand. And so last year's was on pornography. I ask them as they go along to make any suggestions um, for evaluation questions. So if they are looking at evidence-based um, programs that are out there, if that evidence-based program asks questions um, to prove it's to prove that you know their program is working I ask them to jot those questions down because I can use those as a framework for my own evaluation. Um, they do a comprehensive write-up of that literature review. They do a community assessment piece. They create the survey that I then administer to the students um, in the schools that I'm at, and usually that is at each of the schools in each of the three counties. Um, they then will analyze those that data that comes from the community assessment, kind of put it into a, a write-up about what students are needing, wanting, and if they have any preference about how they get the information. And then we, uh, I ask them if they have any curriculum development suggestions, like key pieces that we would be remiss to leave out. Um, so last year they did this on the, the pornography piece. They created, the, they ended up handing over a 77-page literature review, an assessment of the community of the students and their needs, and we were able to go ahead and create a, um, a PowerPoint and a whole program about that information. Um, and so far, it's gone really well this year. So using those external resources is vital. And I, I, I'm not sure, I think I should have put in a, a question here about how many people have existing community partners that they are working with or that they could at least identify. Um, also asking other nonprofits that are doing prevention to share the work that they're doing or curriculums or assessment tools, all of that is great. Um, we've partnered with a, another graduate level course at Portland State that created a new evaluation tool for us last year. And a lot of times, you'd be surprised, those um, classes actually need real life experience as far as creating the actual evaluation tools and so starting there is often a good a good place because the students need the the experience and you need the work and then technical assistance is often available from local coalitions or state agencies um, and so not to be overlooked even if it's just starting with what resources are available for me to begin thinking about how to make this shift so are there any questions that have come through that I've missed while I was talking that would fit here, or should I continue going? Um, let's continue on for now. We've got okay. some other questions that might relate back to your curriculum that we can go back to later. Okay, no problem. Great. So we're going to look at some of these, these pieces. This community assessment piece, I can't stress enough um, how vital and appreciative I've been of this step, and I'm not sure how often this step is actually done. I know it's talked about a lot, but it is so important because I often think, you know, I know how or I think I know what I should be covering. Um, and what I've found is that this, there's this great um, connection between what the literature says and what your community says they need. And to see where those overlap, those overlap places are is sometimes where the richest material for curriculum development can come in. Um, and this has to happen whether you are building a curriculum from scratch or adopting curriculum because if I send you Sark's curriculum, which is 
great and, and a great place to start. It still is not going to match perfectly for what your needs are. And so if you can right off the bat figure out what you need to change to kind of make it fit your community needs, you're going to be hitting the ground running. And then you're always going to be doing assessment and tweaking that, and we're going to get to that a little bit later. But um, you can at least start with what do they need and, and what do the literature reviews say about best practices and where are the overlaps. Um, the last thing I on this slide, too, just says that when you're doing that community assessment, you can always ask students how they want to know the information. And what that does nicely, too, is it helps you um, think about varying your teaching methods. So when creating a curriculum, looking at and learning, just even scratching the surface of your own understanding about what learning styles are, how students learn, um, and the different ways is really important. On our curriculum, I actually have on there um, kind of three check boxes for overarching learning styles, and I check them off for what is how each of those learning styles are being a, a, attended to in each day of curriculum that we've developed because it's really easy for me to teach to my learning style, obviously, because I would learn the material really well. And so it's my own piece of accountability. Am I looking at the needs of the students sort of holistically? And how am I approaching um, teaching them? And can we reach as many students as possible throughout these nine sessions? Um, so. When you're adopting, like I said, you can get the curriculum, look at it, and if you're adopting a curriculum and you see, like, man, they do, you know, a lot of group work, which is really great, and it makes the room feel like it's alive and students will get talking, but you don't see any personal writing or reflections or anything like that in there, you could always take one of those um, activities that you see somebody has been doing in the classroom and change it. Change it to a different learning style, getting at the same sort of learning um, or skill building or um, educational piece that you want to drive home that you're allowing students that don't do well in groups or talking or just sitting there listening that need to do the personal reflecting. You're getting them engaged and, and changing it up. So the theory-driven piece, when you're... Um, looking at various literature reviews that are out there is ours are normally done through these comprehensive literature reviews and oftentimes they are done through our Portland State University students um, and what they end up for us we've landed on using social norms and the feminist model about societal risk factors to offer kind of a framework for our understanding um, of that interplay of individual, relationships, societal, political, cultural, and environmental factors. And so we use that to understand how that influences sexual violence. So we have students start looking at literature kind of through that framework, which helps, you know, there's massive bodies of literature out there. Um, and so what it does is it lets us know what are the best practices in addressing this specific topic. Um, if there are any evidence-based programs out there, what how what have they been doing? How have they been doing it? Um, what does their evidence say about why they think that's been working? And then again, taking these best practices and and lining them back up with okay, now what does that community assessment say? What do they need? And where are the overlaps that we can start looking at from there? Hey, Amy. Oh, we, yeah. Um, there was a question related to the theory piece sure. there. So um, someone asked, what are some sources of reliable theories? What are the sources? Of, well, there's lots of different theories, and I think that's sometimes what agencies need to decide what models are they going to be using, which is why I said that we use the nine um, principles of prevention. We look at the ecological model, and then within that, we really use social norms and the feminist theory model to drive a lot of our um, of our looking at the, the literature and stuff like that. But the theory-driven research available is all over the board. It kind of depends on which topic you're looking at. Um, so like anti-oppression work, there's going to be theory-driven research specific to that, healthy sexuality on ways to educate students. Um, so all of those 
there's, I mean, I, I guess I am not answering that question super well because it's such a huge question. Um, with the literature that we always use, we always say that it needs to be peer-reviewed literature, that it can't just be, you know, somebody writing up their anecdotal experience, which is why using a, a university or a college um, partnership is so great because they have access to all those, um, all those resources and all those forms of literature. So I'm, can you, I wanted to make sure I answered that question and I've lost it over in my chat. Will you just, do you um, have it right in front of you to re-ask? Yeah, the whole question was what kinds of theories do you recommend programs base their curriculum on, which you um, touched on a little bit before, and then the second part of it was what are some sources of reliable theories? Okay, yeah, and that one I would love to we can put my email up, and that one's almost easier if people are looking to build certain curriculums to email me because I have all of our um, literature reviews from the last, like, five years or so, and so I can absolutely send links or the various um, literature review resource lists that we have for people as a place to start because I understand it's overwhelming to think about well, where do we even start with it. So I can send just our resource list to people on specific topics if that's what they're looking for. Great. That's a, um, thanks for that offer. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing that we said we were going to be talking about is this educator education. And well-trained staff, again, things in yellow are one of those nine steps of um, prevention. And I kind of just made a quick list of places where you can get trainings. I have a couple questions for all of you guys about this. Um, I oftentimes talk to people as they're creating prevention curriculums, and a lot of times what they end up saying they're going to trainings about is primary prevention. And in talking, a lot of people know what primary prevention is or what they should be covering, um, and and what they what and myself included sometimes fail to go find trainings on is actually presentation skills um, or that in-depth knowledge about a specific topic where they have gaps. And so some of the things to be thinking about for yourself as you get ready and want to be more prepared in the classroom is where are your gaps? And the question I always ask myself is, where do I find myself hoping that students won't ask probing questions? In which case, I need to go get more in-depth knowledge because the whole point of being an educator is that students ask probing questions. Um, so that's often where I start with myself is where do I feel panicked if students were to ask like an in-depth sort of linkage question between sexual violence and this other issue. Um, I will say that over nine years, I've heard lots of teachers lament over usually one of two things when having guest speakers in their classroom. And one, either the presenter didn't know more about the topic than the teacher does, or two, the presenter was not engaging or dynamic. And so um, when thinking about an educated educator and where your own gaps are and what you need, um, be thinking about just basic presentation skills. Are they where you want them to be? What could you do to get them to a place where you feel really comfortable and engaging and dynamic in the classroom? And what topics might you need um, to increase your own knowledge and depth on? Um, following the lines of our example of the earlier creation of the pornography curriculum last year, I went to a training in Bellingham. I'm actually going to another training in June on the pornography piece, have read a couple books and articles, and had the literature, the 77-page literature review to read. And when they did that literature review, I'd ask them to get, you know, two sides of the story and not just one side of the literature so that I had a really well-rounded understanding of the topic um, before heading into the classroom. And that has really helped. And so... We all have our weaknesses, um, and I think just knowing what they are is really helpful. So even if you have an opportunity to film yourself in a classroom, as uncomfortable as that can feel, watching yourself on screen is an invaluable training tool for yourself that doesn't cost a whole lot of money. So here I've got a question for all of you guys. Do you feel that you have the in-depth knowledge you need um, on the, the root causes of sexual violence?
Okay, let's see. Great. So it looks like most people are in the almost or the yes that they have in-depth knowledge needed um, on the root causes of sexual violence. And the almost place, I, I almost appreciate that one because I always feel like every time I feel like I've got my head wrapped around, you know, root causes of sexual violence or something more that comes out and something more I need to learn more about. So, um, and those, for those who, who feel like, no, I really don't, there is a lot of information out there. And again, that is when I would send you back to some of those community partners, your coalitions and state agencies that are doing your prevention work probably have um, like 500 links they could send you to get you really up to speed. And that's some easy kind of exciting reading to be wrapping your head around. What are the root causes? What does that even mean? And um, you can quickly probably check off a bunch when you're reading through stuff like, oh, I get that and I get that and I get that and highlight the pieces that you need to increase. So if you answered no or almost, um, are there constraints in that gap in knowledge? Do you, you wish you had more training opportunities about each of those root causes? Do you feel like you're constrained because of training dollars or time? Are you unsure where to find these resources or something that, you know, I didn't think about? Okay. Almost ready. Okay, here we go. See what people say. So training opportunities and then a big other, of course. There's something, lots going on for you guys that I, I wasn't thinking about and I apologize. Um, training dollars always. I think people are always feeling constrained there. Okay, so. We are going to go into, oh, I skipped. So we're going, sorry about the jumping around. We're going to go to talking about evaluation. Um, and I have formal, and what you'll see coming up next that I just clicked on inadvertently was informal evaluation, which in a lot of prevention programs, we don't talk about the informal piece or how to use that information, which is stuff that you can do every time you're in the classroom and is really great. So formal evaluation is where we're going to start. And for starters, I just want to say that I know that evaluation sounds really scary and overwhelming. And in like an ideal world, we would all have an evaluation specialist available to us to not only tell us how to evaluate, but to make sense of all the data that comes from the evaluations that we do, um, do in the classrooms. So that being said, um, the place I would start is if you are adopting a curriculum, ask them if they have an evaluation tool and to send it to you. That is part of the curriculum development or uh, curriculum adoption. Um, of course, you may need to make some changes based on the population that you're serving. Um, you may want to ask demographic information if they don't in order for you to be able to look at, okay, the data at the end, am I doing a better job talking to the the girls in the room or the boys in the room? Am I missing something here based on some demographic information? So you can always manipulate that evaluation tool to your needs, but at least ask if you're adopting a curriculum, do you have an evaluation piece that goes along with this? Um, I was really fortunate to have our evaluation. We had about four years or three years worth of data at the point last year. and. Um, we have an Attorney General Sexual Assault Task Force in Oregon that um, was able to have a staff member dedicated to running my data through um, and, and 
through whatever he sent it through. I know it wasn't Excel. That's how I sent it to him, through another data evaluation piece, and then sent me back these pretty pie graphs and sort of helped me make sense of all the data, and I feel much more capable of doing that from here on out. But I will tell you, it can be a little overwhelming, but the information that you get from formal evaluations is key. There are things that I thought would be coming back as really working in the classroom that weren't resonating with students, and so we've tweaked what we were doing or how we were doing it. And then, of course, you need to make sure that, that if you change something or take something out or add something into your curriculum, that you're also changing your evaluation tool. So like I said, and just to be really clear, um, we the formal evaluation is like a pre and post assessment. So it's a pin to the paper. It is um, getting students to fill out what they understand the definition of sexual violence to be, um, where they're at with would they intervene in certain situations. It's a bunch of series of questions about attitudes, beliefs, um, and knowledge around sexual violence. Um, and then some behavioral questions as well. And then we put it away, and it's in this manila envelope system that makes it so it's anonymous and confidential. And then on the last day of the nine sessions of class, we do the same. They fill out the same exact um, evaluation form that is asking those same questions. And then we can enter their information and track their changes. So tracking changes in... Um, knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs about sexual violence. So that's that formal sort of evaluation piece. Are there any questions about the evaluation? I was going to take a look and see if it came through. There were two questions in there, Amy, but I think you answered both of them already, actually. Okay, okay, great. I saw a couple questions pop up, but I didn't have a chance to read them. Um, so informal evaluation is sort of this, you don't necessarily walk out of the classroom with a tangible pre and post test that's been filled out by students, but it's a way to evaluate the knowledge in the classroom every time you're there so that you can make sure that when students are leaving or when, when, they're, yeah, when they're walking out of the classroom today that they have the information that you need to, for them to have and that you didn't just cover the curriculum because that's what was in the curriculum. So I put clicker technology in there because I do think we can all dream big. And for those who don't, don't know who, what clicker technology is, I'm only going to make you want to like salivate after a really great evaluation tool, which is every student as they walk in the door, you'd give them this little handheld clicker. And it's just an anonymous clicker. It's not attached to their name in any way. And then you have like a PowerPoint up there. And as you're going through, you ask kind of random questions. You pull the classroom essentially, kind of like we've done here today, only um, on some content and stuff or experiences. And then it graphs their answers in real time, and then it caches all their responses. So you can go back later and have asked a question at the beginning of the class and the end of the class and go, wow, look at this. You know, 90% of the class had this shift in understanding around this content. and um, Or, wow, 5% got what I was trying to convey, and I need to come back and reteach that tomorrow because of the next class because they did not, I, I didn't do a good job of conveying that information. Um, so the second bullet point I put in is the low-tech clicker technology, and literally you could give students a red, yellow, and green cup to put on their desk, and um, as you're talking, if you see a bunch of yellow, a sea of yellow, it means that there's confusion and students aren't really tracking what you're saying. If you see a bunch of reds, it means that you need to stop and go back because kids are saying it's a red light. They don't, they're not with you. And green cups means they're with you and they want you to keep on chugging. And of course, you're always going to have students that ask questions, but what this low tech kind of evaluation tool does is it allows students who don't want to speak up in class to have a voice, to be seen and have a, a way to convey where they're at with you in the curriculum without having to raise their hand or talk out loud. Um, there are some other pieces of evaluation that you can think of. Um, earning your seat back. So at the end of um, 
some of our the media or the pornography day students are kind of sitting and it's sort of information heavy and, and the lights are out and so um, you can do this part way through you can do it at the end of a presentation where students stand up and they have to tell you one thing that they learned a question that they have or something that's sort of profoundly sticking out in their mind and once they share something they can sit back down and it's your way to kind of gauge okay are the key concepts are students sharing key concepts with me that I wanted them to get from today's um, curriculum, and if they're just getting some sort of, you know, side pieces, then how do I drive home those key concepts that I need them to have if I haven't, if they're not saying them to get their seat back? Um, exit cards is just a way to say the same sort of question. Give me a question, a thought, or something that you've learned, and hand me a card on your way out. It's anonymous, and then you can flip through it later at another time and go, okay, they're on. They've got, they're getting the pieces that I need them to get or see where they're missing information. And there's a lot of others. Um, hopefully, my evaluation love uh, <laughs> is... I don't know if it's hopefully that it's coming through or not hopefully that it's coming through, but I've sort of learned to love evaluation for what it is, which is a really great way to make sure that you're not the only one that knows the information because sometimes, you know, we feel like you can feel like you're going to the classroom and teaching yourself, and that is not um, why you're there. And so using evaluation, formal pre- and post-test stuff, informal um, day-to-day -day check ins is such a great way for you to make sure that the work you're doing, which is vital and important, is being conveyed and absorbed by students in a meaningful way. Hey, Amy, we have an evaluation question here. Okay, great. Um, someone is wondering um, if you have been doing or if you know that it's being done that um, there's evaluation in the school to see if there's been a decrease in the reported violence or sexual assault reports. In the schools that we're in? Yes. No. We are working, and I, I may get to this if we have time, we are working on actually having um, my position or a staff person, an educator, housed in one of our area high schools here next year, and then to start working on um, being really more infused as like an anti-violence stance that the school takes and being in all health classes, health one and health two, not just health two, and to start being a part of that culture of the school. And I, a piece that is on my mind if that happens is an evaluation of asking um, the school about their reporting in previous years, going back and kind of looking in that way and getting a baseline before we get started in the school to be able to start tracking as we have a more um, clear uh, presence and student kind of ownership of the topic of sexual violence prevention. So it is not something that we have done previously. I think it is a wonderful thing that you could do. Um, and again, evaluation is just one of those places where I, I wish we all had, you know, evaluators dedicated to agencies because there's so much information out there that we don't know that would be really helpful in informing our practices. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, actually, and there's one other um, comment that just came up. If you are working in schools that have school-based health centers, they could be a great partner for tracking this info. Is that something that, um, you know, is an option you considered or um, something that's available near you? It is available in two out of the five schools we're currently in have community-based health centers. Both of them, unfortunately, have lost a ton of funding over the last couple of years and have scaled drastically back from where they were um, a few years ago even. But, yes. If we, if this is a road of evaluation that we head down, I think between, I think that's a great suggestion to be looking at the health centers and the counseling and then, you know, actual incident reports and stuff like that. So we would probably approach it from multiple places, but um, unfortunately not all schools here have student-based health centers. And just one more. Okay. Um, can you give us any tips or resources on how to evaluate long-term effects of prevention in school? Um, I don't know if I can do the, if I could give you any tips for um, resources for long-term. I, I mean, I have them. I actually 
was thinking about and never did. I ha there are some links out there. I know I just got a couple um, links from the Oregon Attorney General Sexual Assault Task Force about um, evaluation tools and things to think about when approaching evaluation in school-based um, programs. So I think this is Cicely asking this question. Cicely, if you would like to or anybody else, I can forward that on to you. Um, and, it, and it is comprehensive, so be ready for some bedtime late night reading, <laughs> which is just what you want to read on a Friday night. Um, but it's big and comprehensive, and I think it is a wonderful place at least to start tearing into with a highlighter. So I see that you said yes, please. So we'll make sure I'll, we'll get my email up here somehow, and I'm happy to send you guys all the stuff I've got. And and again, I'm sure that um, Wixup even has stuff that you need as well on evaluation and, and resources. That would be great. Yeah, and if you want to send it to Trisha and I, we can make sure it goes out to everybody on the call with all the other follow-up materials. There you go. Perfect. I can send you guys reading material for a lifetime, and I'm happy to do so. I would love that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so data, data, data. All this talks about data. Now what do you do with it? And um, you use it. And so many people sit on data because using it seems scary for lots of different reasons. One, it means you have to use it. You have to, you have to learn how to read the data. And two, you have to maybe recognize that things that you've been doing don't work. And that is sometimes really hard, especially when um, so many prevention programs are a labor of love and can be very labor intensive. I know a lot of prevention programs get proprietary or really want to know that what they're doing is working. And um, I'm neither of those things. And so I'm all about using the data. I'm not proprietary. I'm happy to share because quite frankly, I just want reductions in the rates of sexual violence to happen. So I'm all about sharing what we do, and I'm pretty honest about the fact that not everything we do works, and I'm actually okay with that. There are times that I've looked at the data and seen what didn't work and learned more from that information than I did from looking at the data and having it say that, yeah, this is all working really well. Um, so every summer I take the time to plug in all the pre and post assessments I run them through an evaluation like data tool for us. We have an Excel spreadsheet. I think that um, Cliff at the Attorney General Sexual Assault Task Force ran it through SPSS. Whatever evaluation, you know, kind of assessment thing that you can run your data through is going to probably work. Um, and I make changes. And so I'll give you an example. We are in three counties, and one county that is very much community-based. It's the county with the cows across the street, um, which I think is very much about, like, you help your neighbor and times get tough and you help each other out. Those students tend to have um, a really well rounded understanding about bystander intervention and how to do it and what to do and the importance of doing it. Um, they don't have as much knowledge on some of the media stuff. And so I make sure that I don't, rush through the media, that if we need an extra half a day, that we slide into that extra half a day because I know we've got a little bit of space to wiggle on the bystander skill building piece because they have a lot of that. They bring that to the table with their just their own sort of community culture. And then I know in other um, more urban settings, it's, it seems to be more of this like put your head down and you, don't, you mind your own business. Um, and so there is a lack of knowledge coming into the pre-assessments around the bystander piece, and so I make sure to really build time to talk about not only the importance of bystander intervention, but just the fundamental skills of how to do it. And so using your data is so important, and when you use it, you'll actually see a shift in the positive um, the next time around, and which is a really satisfying feeling. The other thing I would say about using the data is but if you see that you need to make some significant changes in your curriculum, it's really easy to go, okay, well, that didn't work, so I'm going to try this. And I would say go back to the drawing board sometimes. There are times where you just need to start over with a literature review and a new community assessment and start the process on that one or two days of curriculum all over again because something wasn't working. And so the just kind of guessing and going, is, I think, is – 
sort of risky because you can end up coming around for another school year having guessed wrong instead of really being guided in a very thoughtful kind of methodical way when creating um, a, a different way to go when the data says that did not work. Okay, we are leaving data and we are going into the how do I get in question. Um, you know what, I'm going to skip to this question really quick. Oh, I had a question. I, I failed to give WhatsApp this question. I was going to ask how many of you guys are already in the in the classroom. Um, I wonder, can people raise hands? Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. Have them, and then it will count. And I saw somebody already had their hand raised for a question, and so when everybody unraises their hand, if you were the person with your hand raised for a question, just leave your hand raised and we'll come back. So how many of you are already in the classroom? Okay, we are at 37 out of 98 so far. Forty-two out of ninety-eight. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. You guys can unraise your hands, and then we will go ahead and answer the question that's on the screen. How many ses sessions, also referred to as dosage in the prevention world, do you have with the same students? So, do you see them one to two times, three to four times, five to six times, or seven to nine times? I had somebody say that it depends on the community, how many times they're going in, which makes sense from people at you in different amount of times. And somebody else says three to five times, depending on the school. Great. Okay, I'm going to skip to the results. Oh, a couple more people. So maybe I failed too to ask the question and just put it in a zero there. Um, so a lot of people are in one to two times, three to four times. Other people are up into the five, six, seven, nine times. And so, yeah, let it, okay. So I'm reading some comments. Great. This is excellent. Anytime you are in the door at all, you have an in, and we are going to use that in to get you in seven to nine times. Of course, I should say that if you're going to ask for seven to nine sessions, you should probably have seven to nine session curriculum built, which is presumably why you guys are here doing this um, webinar. So you've got the summer. You've got the summer to be putting together your curriculum or pulling on and trying to look at have as many people that do um, seven to nine session curriculum, send them to you and then you can cut and paste and put them together or do a community assessment or get that ready. Um, so if you're going to ask for the time, of course, know what you're going to do with the time. I started out with solicitation letters. So I, when I started at SARC, we were doing one session um, Curriculum, I, that very first year was like, this is ridiculous. I can't do this. We need to at least see them three times. So we went to three times. And then the following year, we made pitches to say, okay, we're going to make the leap to seven to nine. And I started with solicitation letters to all teachers in all the counties that we, all the health teachers in all the counties that we were going to. Um, and definitely the teachers that we are already in their classrooms with. And I just made the pitch. And what I did was make it really easy for them to see the value of having SARC in the classroom. All of our curriculums are linked to state and federal health standards. I make the process really clear. I let them know that we are research driven, which is Theory driven and research driven, those are educational buzzwords. Teachers know what that means because they're required when they adopt curriculum to have it be evidence based or research or theory driven um, to bring it into the classroom. I also talk about the fact that we do an evaluation, um, that we are doing assessments. Those are educational buzzwords and they will help you get in the door because teachers want to know that you know why you're doing what you're doing and that you're going to make sure it's working and that it's not a waste of the students' time or their valuable classroom time. 
we highlight funding sources that has helped us um, just because we got we've been funded through the CDC um, and so letting teachers know that that's where our funding source comes from to develop this curriculum and maintain the education program has been helpful and then I've asked other teachers that when you're in the door for three to five sessions, have them write you a letter of recommendation or ask them to write a paragraph or two about why they enjoy having your program there and put that in on the side or at the bottom so that there's an endorsement from other teachers or educators saying the value of your program or some anecdotal voice from students um, and what they have gotten out of your program being there. Um, I was just coming to see what some of the questions were that were coming through. As far as the person asking if we do our curriculum out in the community, we used to do um, like boys and girls clubs and community-based places. We still do one in one to three um, kind of awareness campaigns there when asked. I don't because my funding is for prevention only. I can only do the seven to nine sessions as laid out as a primary prevention because that's solely what I'm funded for. But we have other components um, and have we created a component for adult influencers? So I, I'm assuming that question is are we doing kind of the prevention work with adults? And again, other programs are what we do do with the primary, with our education program in schools is send home parent packets that share all the information that their students will be getting in the classroom. Um, and we do that for a few reasons. One, it helps educate parents. Two, it helps parents that feel sometimes defensive if their students know more than them, although I always find that that's just an ideal place to be as a parent to stuff my kids know more than me. Um, but it makes parents caught off guard, and so we like to have them have the same information um, and so that they can have richer conversations at home when, when some of this stuff goes home. And it also allows um, parents to know exactly what is being covered in the classroom, that we are not there, you know, um, under uh, behind a veil of secrecy. We want them to know why we're there. We want them to know the information we're sharing with their students. We want them to have it too. So that does some, some um, education for the parents. And then we have getting in um, continued. This is where I was just briefly going to mention that we are working with one school. Um, we have another school kind of on the back burner in case this first school isn't able to make it happen, but with another high school that's interested. And again, having us be housed, we would just have an office in the school. Um, and what this allows us to do is just influence the school as its own enclosed community um, and, and looking at, you know, teacher education, being a resource for the students if they want to do community service projects or awareness campaigns, that they have, ha have an in-house resource as a liaison for um, when students disclose to be able to kind of give them that warm handoff either to school counselors or other community resources, and then also to expand our prevention into Health One and Health Two. So essentially we would be seeing students instead of nine times, we'd be seeing them 18 times because we would see them throughout both of their um, required health courses. So if you have this opportunity, and right now schools are kind of in a world of hurt with budget, massive budget cuts, and um, I know that that is why this one high school like really jumped on the opportunity and is, is trying to make it happen. Um, just because they realize that they are cutting services and they don't want to have to do that. They are feeling, you know, very constrained. And so this is one way for them to have a resource available for free in their school that really bolsters their school as a community. And so if you have this opportunity, if you're in discussions with um, administrators or anybody and they're interested, it is another way to approach curriculum uh, or prevention instead of thinking about how many schools can I go to, thinking how profoundly and deeply can I impact this one school knowing that these students will then have an impact on other people in their lives um, and not feeling like you have to get out to as many schools as possible. Um, so there's a question about can parents opt their students out based on religious beliefs? It, all, all the teachers that I go to at least do an opt out letter home. It's like these are the topics we'll be covering in our health class. If you want your students to opt out of any of the curriculum, please let us know. 
And so if they are opting out of violence prevention or sexual health units, then yes, they would be out of ours. Those are the two key um, health standards that we cover. Um, so they would be out for that. Um, in the nine years that I've been doing this, it has, I can count maybe on one hand, students that have um, gone home after having us there for a day or two and decided, talked to their parents and decided that they wanted to go to the office or to the library and do a packet of information instead of the information we offer. So fortunately, it hasn't happened too often, but it does happen occasionally, and yes, they can opt out. Um, great. We have a couple of questions we saved here, Amy, if you yeah. want to read them off. Oh, yes, because look at this <laughs> right there. Yeah, we've got a couple of those. <laughs> okay, so we've got a question. How do you address institutionalized violence occurring both nationally and internationally? And the example given is sexual abuse by PSA employees, police brutality, prison rape, military assault, um, institutionalized torture. Um, this is kind of an area that's lacking a lot of other curriculum and not really sure how to address that. That is an excellent question, and it is lacking. We cover it, but I, I can tell you right off the bat, we do not do those topics justice at all. We cover them when they come up when we're talking about oppression and institutionalized oppression. Um, prison rape, nine times out of ten, comes up on day one and usually comes up in sort of an inappropriate, joking manner about statistics around male survivors or male perpetration, male victimization. And um, I always answer that in a very, you know, non-flippant way that it's usually presented as and send them to places for resources like stopprisonerrapespr.org. Um, we talk about the serious matter of institutionalized um, oppression and violence and some of those real experiences. But I have to say um, it is lacking. It is not done well in our program because it's not on our radar as, as one of the key components to be discussing. It's something that I am going and very interested in. If we are housed in the school next year, we'll be creating a whole new nine sessions of curriculum. And one of the key components of those nine sessions will be going more in depth into oppression. Um, and there, I think we would spend much more time on probably a whole day dedicated to institutionalized violence. And what does that even mean? And how is that experienced? And what does that mean culturally for, uh, for individuals within those institutions? So currently, my answer is that we don't do them well. My longer-term answer is that they can be done, and if it's, a, if it's a key factor that your agency chose to look at, I would say it would fit very nicely into a day um, or half of your anti-oppression day as really driving home how oppression is institutionalized and then experienced by individuals. So it can be done, and it can fit into this topic nicely. Um, we just don't do it great currently. Great. Thanks. Um, we've got another question here. So what do you find that the teens enjoy the most about your curriculum? Um, I think that it's active and that it's engaging. Well, there, there's, this is a two-pronged answer. So one, we get them out of their seats a lot. We get them into group works. We do individual work. So again, when we're talking about varied teaching methods within nine sessions, we are doing a lot of different learning styles that are tapped into um, and throughout a day. So I think that students just enjoy that we don't, as guest speakers, come in and sit on a stool and just talk at them, which is sometimes their experience and oftentimes what they expect. And I I think they like that they're caught off guard in that, in that way. And then the other thing that I always get feedback from students, because we always ask for open-ended feedback on those um, post-assessments that we give, is that we have candid discussions with them. I, at the high school level, talk to them in a way that they are ready for this information um, because they are. And sometimes it's shocking and sometimes it's new information, but I, I treat them, um, I treat them in the most mature manner around this information. I am honest and candid and I don't sugarcoat things, but um, give them the information that they're asking for and allow them to ask questions or say things that are victim blaming or um, sort of embarrassing or, you know, offensive in ways. And I don't shut them down or shoot them down for asking. We use it as an opportunity to learn and grow. And they, their feedback is always that they just love how open and honest the conversations are. 
and the curriculum builds those opportunities in, I should say. Those are built into the curriculum to allow students to grapple with the information that's given to them. Great. And then um, there's a follow, a second part of that question, too, that um, this person has interest in doing more games and activities as learning tools. Um, is that built into your curriculum, and do you have any of those resources that you can share out with us? Yeah. Um, I have two books that just came to mind that I'm not going to try to tell you the, the names of them off the top of my head because that's not my strong suit. That would be like trying to remember people's names, and I don't do that well. So I will find those books and, and send those as part of the resource email that I send out. Um, so there are a couple games around, you know, theater and, and oppression work or vi anti-violence work. Um, but I wouldn't say that we have games built in, but we have activities. So we do um, interactive stuff, and some days could definitely be changed to be more engaging, especially if you're in small groups versus groups of 40 students. Um, but there are resources out there, and I'm happy to share those with people that are interested in kind of a more um, physical movement approach to some of the content. Um, we have got a few more questions about your curriculum, and this one is about um, do you have to go before a school board to get approval, and then do you sign MOUs with the school district? Oh, great question. Um, this wasn't in my getting in, um, or maybe it was and I skipped it. Oh, it is. I'll go back. Now, I know this depends on your community and the hoops that you have to jump through, but do you see how I put teachers in all caps? I go through teachers because teachers let me in the classroom and administrators sometimes, um, some administrators are awesome and they get it and they give me easy access and other times teachers are the first step to getting in the door and so that is where I start is with teachers and that's where I've had the most luck getting in um, and then they often are the ones that will let their principals or their vice principals know who their guest speakers are and why they're there and everything else. So I've never had to get a curriculum um, approved by a school board but we're also not asking a school district to adopt our curriculum which would be a totally different process. Um, so because we're coming in as guest speakers that's kind of where we that line is um, at least so far is anything that we've had to to address um, and MOUs right now the school that we're hoping to be housed in their their school the school district's attorney is drafting up a contract sort of an MOU for understanding of how that that um, relationship will work, mainly they're wanting to lay the groundwork for any other future organizations, too, that may be asking for the same thing of just, you know, what are the logistics, what are the liabilities, what are the um, responsibilities around confidentiality and all of that. Okay, great. And we've got two questions here that are kind of related to the age groups that you work with. So um, is there a reason you chose high school students over junior high students? And then um, if you were going to work with students not in a school, like per se um, homeschool students, what age bracket would you recommend working with? Oh, my gosh, these are great questions. I love the junior high question. I can give you my flippant response, which is I don't work with junior high students. Um, that takes a very special, special type of person. So more power to you if you are one of those those people. Um, my more methodical response is our the, um, the content is really for a more mature audience. Um, we have very – that being said, junior high students are doing way more at an earlier age than I would like maybe to admit to myself. So some of this is very appropriate at the junior high level. Um, I do think you could take this curriculum and adapt it to that, but the candid conversations we have about healthy sexuality, the very candid information that we share about media, and certainly the pornography unit would all need to be um, sort of adapted into an age-appropriate um presentation at the junior high level. A lot of the other stuff I think would be very easy to bring into junior highs. So we used to do junior highs. They they really had a tough time transitioning into the seven to nine presentations with us. And so we made a, we just made kind of a strategical decision to 
focus on high schools as our area because we were having success in getting access to those students. And then um, that's where my heart is at also. So that's that's part of the, the response as well. And then if I were to do this at home school, what, the question was what, what age would I focus on? Is that what you said? Yes. Mm -hmm. I would really think that it would depend on the child. I mean, that would almost be like its own community community assessment right there. Um, I mean, whoever is homeschooling the child, whatever parent is, I would think could look through this curriculum or any curriculum around this topic and decide um, what pieces – their, their child was needing, I, I'm not answering this question very well because that's a tough one. I mean, I know in grade school, there's a lot of anti-violence, anti-bullying, um, body sort of health things that go on. And I think all of those are foundational root um, places to start when looking to prevent violence. Um, first time perpetration and all of that and then on up from there so that's a non-answer answer and I'm sorry um, I don't know that I'm the best person to be answering that question it that's feels okay. really individualistic for a, a student being who's homeschooled as well yeah we um, had a follow-up question related to when you were talking about uh, you did the pornography unit with the high school students but, you know, you were saying you'd have to modify that probably for the middle school students, but do you run into barriers, um, you know, from principals or superintendents or people at a district level who might find out that you're even covering pornography with high school students? I was so scared that that is exactly what I was going to run into, which is why I ignored students asking about pornography for a couple of years because I just thought, there's just no way I can do this. I'm just going to pretend like they're not even asking me about this. Um, having spent a year very methodically developing this curriculum, having a 77-page seven, lit review, um, has made me feel more comfortable. We've done it all this school year, and I have not had a single pushback um, from parents, students, teachers, or administrators. I've had a principal who's never come in in the eight years previous knowing that I was there, sit in on any topic other than the pornography one, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, how is this going to go? And he was totally on board. He thought it was wonderful. He was really excited that we were there talking about that. Um, so I have not experienced any sort of, you know, push back around that topic. And again, we are not there slipping this in into a bigger curriculum. I'm not trying to hide that we're there talking about pornography. We very much share the studies and the links, um, not, not causal, but correlative information around pornography usage and vi sexual violence. Um, we put all the studies in there, we cite them, and I just updated our parent packet to reflect this piece of information that's being shared in the classroom. Again, being very transparent about um, all of our topics. And so I think that transparency has helped. We're not, we're not trying to catch anyone off guard. And there's a direct link to the topic at hand. Great. It looks like we're almost out of time. I know there's um, some more questions that we could spend time on today, but we will provide um, some follow-up um, documents and our contact information so folks can connect with us and connect with Amy and get more of those resources. But just before we go, um, Cheryl Nelson, you've had your hand raised. If you have a question that you want to share over the phone, um, if you press star seven, you'll be unmuted and you can ask that question now. Okay, well, that will be the wrap-up of our webinar. Thank you so much, Amy. You've been just an absolutely fantastic presenter today and shared so much with us. And have uh, we have more questions now, so you'll probably be hearing from all of us and uh, really excited to see what your curriculum looks like. So um, if everyone can just participate in the evaluation, it will pop up when the webinar wraps up. We'd love to get your feedback so we can you know, continue to offer resources that are useful to you. And 
Thank you so much for calling in today. Sorry, is there just one last thing for, can we put my email address up there if people are interested? I had mentioned earlier that our curriculum is just 20 bucks and basically that covers our cost of our supplies and to um, send it out to people. And so I'm happy to, if people want to email me to purchase a copy, I can send them an invoice and then um, start getting those out in the mail. And the easiest way is just to email me. So is there a way to get my email up there for people? Yeah, Ella, if you just want to say it, we'll type it into the chat box. Sure, it's Amy L, so A M Y L, at Sark Organ, S A R C Organ is spelled out, dot org. Great, thank you. And yeah, Trish and I will make sure we send out all the follow up um, documents that we have and uh, get everybody connected to Amy so that you can check in with her and try to access her curriculum. Great, great. Thank you so much for everyone who participated and. Um, Keep up the good work. Contact me if you have questions. I'm happy to chat, phone, or email. Great. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.